You are listening to Hit Play, Not Pause, a feisty menopause podcast for active, performance-minded women. I am your host, Celine Yeager. Each week, I bring you advice from athletes, scientists, researchers, and other experts to help you feel and perform your best, no matter what your hormones are doing. This show is a production of Live Feisty Media. Hello, strong, feisty women. So this week, we're talking about the Menopause 200, which, as this week's guest, ultra runner Cam Prange assures us, is not a race you can register for on the internet. Instead, it's what Cam has deemed the menopause transition, because it can take as much research, planning, training, and reconvicting your lifestyle to thrive through it as any 100 or 200 mile ultra running event. I found Cam through an article she wrote on all this titled The Menopause 200 for ultrarunning.com. I'll read you the first paragraph because honestly, it's gold and it's just why I knew I had to have her on the show. So she wrote, to be clear, I did not sign up for the menopause 200. My ovaries did. Oh, they had warned me this mandatory event was coming, waking me with a drenching sweat or anxiety storm, tapering periods, and replacing my brain with mush that increasingly felt like it was thinking on the wrong side of frosted glass. I was perfectly content to ignore it all, insert boiled frog emoji here, until I found myself at the start line, unable to run. I highly recommend reading the rest of the Menopause 200, as well as the articles that she's written following that. And I'll put a link to all of those in the show notes. Uh, You can find them at ultrarunning.com. She's writing this series and it's really, really good. Along with being an ultra runner and a writer, Cam is a veterinarian. So she's very science-based and we just had a great conversation about her logical and emotional journey through this transition that every active woman can benefit from hearing whether or not you run a single step in your life. I hope you enjoy this one as much as I did. All right, before we get to it, Winter has settled in here in the Northern Hemisphere, and I am very much looking forward to our first ever feisty menopause performance retreat that we are holding in Lake Nona, Florida, which is right outside of Orlando, and it will be in February, the weekend of the 24th through the 26th. Not only will it be warm and sunny, but we are going to have a ton of fun as well as get a lot of education and exercise sessions packed into the weekend. The retreat includes two nights at Lake Nona Wave Hotel, a DARI motion analysis, which is a system that analyzes your movement patterns to help you prevent injuries, uh, private strength and conditioning sessions, nutritional sessions, and a private menopause DECA event on Sunday, which is a fun, non-competitive hands-on training and performance session. This is the first time doing anything like this for us, so we're keeping it small. Space is limited to about 20 participants. If you like the idea of a spa vacation of a very different variety, this is 100% for you. Thank you to the women who have already signed up. I'm super stoked, and we are looking forward to seeing you in sunny Florida. If you haven't signed up yet, you can do so at feistymenopause.com, and I will put a link to that in the show notes. Quick reminder that this Saturday is our Hit Play Not Pause Virtual Summit. About 600 or so of you have signed up already. Thank you for that. It's going to include talks on hormone therapy, injury prevention, intuitive eating, pelvic health, and uh, much more. Tickets are only 20 bucks. You can watch the replays anytime. So head on over and get your tickets at feistymenopause.com right now. I'll link that up in the show notes too. As always, I invite you to follow us at Feisty Menopause on Instagram and Facebook. Come on over to feistymenopause.com and sign up for my free weekly blog. And thank you for the kind reviews that are continuing to come in and for sharing the show with your friends and on your socials. I've got some really great guests coming up and it's all because of you. All right. Quick thank you to Inside Tracker for their support of the show. I got my blood work back last week and I was able to drop my LDL cholesterol 30 points over the past few months, uh, tinkering with my nutrition and supplementation according to some of the recommendations in their blogs. I am really pretty psyched about that. So thank you again, Inside Tracker, for your support of the show and for all of us. All right, enough of me. Let's hear a little bit more about our awesome sponsors and get on with the show. All right. 
Well, Cam, I'm really happy that we found each other through uh, my writing fun, Tom Kellogg, shared with me your Menopause 200 essay, and I loved it. So I am psyched to have you uh, with us on the show. Well, and I'm delighted to be here. And um, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, let's let's start there. Let's let's talk about how you arrived at um, the menopause, you know, writing the menopause 200. What was the catalyst for it? Uh, I'd love for you to tell our listeners, you know, a bit about that opening race that you talk about. Uh, I think it was called the North Nasty. Well, the North Nasty. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Um, So uh, so this was a year ago, last year. Uh, and I was, um, training for a 50 mile race. Um, that's a very hilly, relatively technical course. And, um, in Portland, uh, if you don't want to go to the gorge, um, there are some trails nearby that you can go train on. And one of them is called the North Nasty. So it's an 11.5 mile trail with 2,900 feet of vertical. Um, so just slightly over, if you do the math, it comes out to 252 feet per mile. Yeah. Um, the caveat to that is there's one section that goes up almost a thousand feet in less than a mile. So, you know, it's, it, 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 it's some, it's some good serious that's training. rock climbing. I mean, that's uh, almost, almost. Yeah. Um, and, um, I had planned what's called a double. So you park, you get all your stuff on, you go run one loop and then you, you know, get more hydration, more calories and go do the other loop. Um, and I, it, it was just, you know, one of those days, sometimes you have workouts where you like, I can't believe I was scheduled this for today. I'm just not feeling it, but it's on the schedule. I really need to go get this done. And, um, I, I think in the article, the way I phrased it, and I, this is the way I think about it. I struggled to start. Um, I struggled <laughs> through the first loop. Um, I kept looking at my watch thinking, this is just really not possible that I'm going this slowly. Um, and I got back to the car and of course you have those thoughts of, do I go on the other loop? But I'm like, absolutely. I got to go to the other loop, but I need to tell my wife that I'm going to be really late. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I downloaded um, a, an audible book and went on again and, and got it done. But I was like, that was, it just was like an overnight change in how I was running. So, um, yeah. And, and what did you, what did you attribute that to? Like, did you, did you uh, attribute really that to, did, yeah. yeah. So, you know, so, so it's, it's that interesting question where, you know, you're slowing down, um, you know, at, at 58, I wasn't running as fast as I was at 51, but I've been, mm-hmm. I've been running well. And um, I've actually, you know, had uh, some speed work um, earlier in the month where I was like, yeah, totally, you know, stoked about the splits and everything. Um, and I really didn't, didn't know, didn't understand. I just, um, I went home feeling pretty miserable and like what on earth just happened. Hmm. Um, and you know, to put it in context, I've been running like most of my life. Um, you know, I'm not a fast runner. I'm not a podium runner, but I'm a lifelong runner and um you know i've done everything from 10ks to marathons to 100 mile races um and so i know like bad training days happen right but this just (laughs) this just felt awful and it took um interestingly a conversation with a friend of mine um dana who's an ultra running coach um, who mentioned your podcast. And so the next morning, my wife and I are doing our strength training in the gym. We're like, oh, well, let's listen to hit play, not pause. And it happened to be the estrogen matters episode. Um, and it was, that was literally the moment where I went, oh, expletive. I think I just figured a lot of things out. And so, of course, the first thing I did is went and got the book and then being a, a veterinarian and also a scientist, the next thing I did was get on PubMed and start looking at studies. And then I was like, okay, um, 
I, I think I, I, I think in my case, as I sorted it all out, um, what I need is some help with the transition. And I think I've been denying some other signs. Um, I was just going to ask that. <laughs> I was just going to ask that. So yep, yep, we're, yep. we are, we are 58, which is a little on the later side, you know, when yeah. you're, when you're looking, I mean, that would actually be defined as sort of late onset. Late onset, right. Yeah. But, but did you, were you having your periods? Did you have any other signs that something, yes. you know, was amiss? Did you have any hot flashes? Did you have any, you know, the other stuff? So these are all the, how many things can you ignore? Um, so <laughs> many. So, <laughs> so um, I, you know, I had my, uh, my uh, last um, menstrual cycle uh, at 52. Um, and the big change with that was suddenly I needed readers, um, and, um, and then also a little distance correction. And, you know, I had definitely experienced, some um, hot flashes, particularly at night. And this is where, um, I'm just going to chuckle at myself a little bit because it usually coincided with, I'd be training for a race and I'd be heat training, um, and so I'm like, well, this is just more heat training. It's just in the middle of the night and I didn't plan it, but, and, and never stepping back and saying, well, wait a minute. It's one thing to do planned heat training. It's right. another thing to have your sleep disrupted, <laughs> but you know, that's kind of the ultra runner. We're tough. Um, and I would say endurance athlete, you know, we're used to pushing through things. Um, the other big thing I was experiencing was just a, a mental fog. Um, it really, I was um, leading a team, you know, I'm a, a veterinarian, um, I was at a university, you know, needing to make decisions. And sometimes I was like, I just couldn't do it. And so that was a very different thing. And I, again, just, I was like, well, I am getting older. And so maybe my brain is just slowing down a little bit. Um, and then the third thing I experienced was some anxiety. Like I, I am not an anxious person. I'm classically somebody I go to bed, I sleep all night and that was fine. Um, but I would wake up in the middle of the night and be just churning on things. Um, but again, all of those and it's an interesting piece, um, Dr. Jen Gunter in her book, The Menopause Manifesto, um, you know, she talks about menopause is just one paint on the canvas of, of life. Um, and were any of those menopause or were some of them aging? What I do know is when I reached out to my PCP and I said, you know, I'm just, these are all the things I'm feeling and I think I really need help. And she's like, okay, so let's just start a trial of, of um, just estrogen to see. And I mean, my training log is amazing. It was just like magic. I know, you know, people say, oh no, pharm pharmacokinetically, it can't work that quickly. Like within 48 hours, my notes in the log are, wow, I'm feeling better. I'm, you know, I'm thinking more clearly. I'm moving better. Um, I'm happy to get out the door. Um, and so, um, it was, you know, for me, um, uh, using some, um, menopause hormone therapy, uh, really was, was tremendously impactful and positive. Um, so, yeah. So you were experiencing just to, so I have like a bit of a timeline on yeah. that. So you started it with, were those, were those symptoms all sort of occurring after turning 52 or were they closer to this bad, really they're, like they're signature run? The, yeah, they were closer to the bad. And, um, and, and I think that's an interesting, you know, the body doesn't just turn off the, the estrogen. And I think it's such an interesting question of at what point do the levels get low enough that, it, and I suspect for, for every me, woman it's different. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you yeah. know, I think I had probably a longer glide slope than yeah. a lot of people It sounds um, like between my final menstrual period. And when I really started feeling um, mm -hmm. the impact 
And then who knows, maybe I was more aware because, you know, there was COVID, there was, you know, all of the other things going on and um, maybe my body was dealing with it all before. And then you layer on all that extra stress and suddenly it was like, whoa, this is, this is a little bit too much, but it was definitely, you know, 56 and on, I was like, what is going on? I'm definitely changing. My, my running is changing the anxiety, the sleep disturbances, all of that were, were pretty significant during that, that period. Yeah. That's so interesting because you, you know, you hear other, and when I talk to doctors, it sort of bears it out. Some women like literally go off a cliff. Like it is almost like a light switch and other people have like, you know, more of that undulation or, you know, it sounds like you had like that, you said that longer ramp before you were like, what is going on? You know, and then I really went yeah. off the cliff. I mean, yeah. and, and, and you know, as a runner, to be running a certain you know pace, you know, as an ultra runner, I know I go on a trail. I'm going to clock off this many miles. Right. That's just normal. And then suddenly, you're one or two miles less in that hour. I mean, that's and it and it just happened like that. And yeah. um, it was that was really that was definitely the wake up call for me. Yeah. So how soon after that did you um, pursue the hormone therapy? Oh, pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I, um, I will say that I I made, I think, a very wise choice. I, I um, first thing I did was say, wait a minute, I am not going to be ready for this 50K. Um, and that's when I, I dropped from the 50K or the 50 miler to the mm-hmm. 50K. Um, that turned out to be a very wise decision, um, just you know, I, I did the run, but it wasn't spectacular and I would not have those extra 20 miles would have been a real push. Um, and it was very shortly after that, that I started the hormone, uh, the menopause hormone therapy and, um, yeah. And then, that, you know, I will say that that's been its own journey because of course, you know, you go into the whole thing of how long do I do this and risk benefit ratio. And then there's the piece of, um, you got to add in the progesterone at some point. Right. So I was wondering how that. do you do that? And for me, it turned out um, I was really sensitive to it. And so felt incredibly PMSy. And um, I have a wonderful PCP who um, patiently worked with me. <laughs> um, we've done a lot of tinkering. Um, but I think, you know, we're kind of got things, um, reasonably balanced right now. So, yeah. Yeah. I would, if you would, if you are open to sharing a bit of that, just because I know people really run into that, like that is, you are not alone and, um, it it can be really troubling. I mean, women have had, when they have trouble with progesterone, it's, it's troubling and it's, it was awful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, you um, if you think you already like have a new body, and then suddenly it's just all this water retention, and um, and and just lethargic, it, literally everything from from PMS. Um, and so, kind of the first thing we did was like, okay, let's just back that off and just go back to estrogen for a little bit. Yep. Make sure that the dose is okay, and we double checked all of that. Um, and, and again, she was just tremendously patient. Um, and, um, uh, literally we spent probably 30 minutes in her office talking about all the different options. Um, for me, um, I opted to go with a pill that's a low dose estrogen and also a low dose, um, progesterone, um, combination. Mm. And, um, that, worked way better than having two separate pills that I was taking. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was turn, it was just a much lower dose of, of uh, progesterone as well. Um, I opted to do the pill over a patch because I'm a very heavy sweater and I also swim. And so even though there's potentially less long-term risk with the patch, that just wasn't a, it wasn't going to be a good option for me. It wasn't going to stay stuck on. Um, and I probably could have done a, a vaginal ring. Um, but again, you know, it comes down to sort of time and, and it, it, it's a lot easier if I just say in the morning, I take this right after breakfast. Um, and I don't have to worry about 
going in every 90 days, those kinds of things. But those are very personal choices, um, knowing how I work out and my lifestyle. So, yeah. Yeah. No, thank you for sharing that. Uh, you know, I had on uh, Dr. Heather Hirsch, who talked a lot about sort of troubleshooting hormone therapy yes. because it requires troubleshooting often. It does. Yeah. And, um, you know, she had mentioned those combinations as something that is successful for a lot of women. So the, the combo pills that are missing yeah. them are relatively new. So that's good to hear. Yes. And um, yeah, it that has been a nice change. And then, of course, and then it dovetails into the next question of how long mm. Um, and I think, I think it was also, uh, Dr. Hirsch who said, um, you know, she finds patients who go on menopause hormone therapy, they feel great and they don't want to come off it. I'm just going to raise my hand and say, yes, mm -hmm. um, that is true. Um, in my case, um, uh, because I have a family risk of osteoporosis, mm -hmm. um, plus I just have, you know, I'm five, two, I'm right around 112 pounds, that is the classic at risk. And so um, I'm, I'm going to say this because I think it's really important for other women to know about because I don't think we talk about osteoporosis early enough. Um, insurance doesn't cover DEXA scans until you're 65. And I went to my PCP and I said, look, I've got a family risk. I can see it in my father. I saw it in my mother. I have all the physiologic risk factors. Can we figure out how to get me a DEXA scan? And, and really I'll pay for it. And so we did that and she was, you know, she's like, oh, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. Well, it turns out I'm not fine. Um, I have good bone density in my hips and my femurs, but my lumbar spine, I have osteoporosis. So I'm 58 years old and I have osteoporosis of the lumbar spine. Um, that's a big deal. And so then that started an additional conversation of the FDA approved therapy for osteoporosis is estrogen. Yep. Um, and so, you know, we just, we will continue our, our conversations, but, but I anticipate probably being one of the long-term um, menopause hormone therapy users because the mobility is important um, as well. So, you know, I'm not discounting the other risk factors, but if I lose my mobility. Osteoporosis a, kills a lot of people. I mean, it let's does, be clear. it does. Yeah. And, and it doesn't, that does not get talked enough about, I think. Uh, yeah. In the literature. No, I think that's really important to talk about. And yeah. I, yeah, it's, and they, they can monitor all the stuff, right? You know, they yes. they can they can keep an eye on all of your your metrics and your health. So I think I think you're going to see more women opting for that long term hormone therapy, whatever it looks like, for all of you know all of these reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and um, it's you know, and like with anything, it may adjust as you go on, but but that's it doesn't have to be like all or nothing, right? It's yeah, yeah. yeah. So how's your running now? <laughs> well, it's it's baseline. Um, so uh, I did I chose not to race this season. Um, you know, to for me to race comfortably, uh, my training base needs to be about sixty miles uh, a week. Um, I'm nowhere near that, um, partly because I have a kind of niggling um, foot injury that may be a result of combination of an old injury and then some, you know, tendon changes with menopause. And so mm -hmm. working with a physical therapist on that um, and we're making slow, gradual progress, but I just decided to take the pressure off myself and not race this season, have a lower miles, enjoy my runs. Um, and, um, and also work on things like plyometrics and start getting back some speed work, which by the way, as an endurance runner, speed work, isn't my, yes. <laughs> it's, it's not my thing, but I know I need to do it. Um, and so getting back to those pieces and using this as a build year, um, with the idea, uh, next year I'll be 60. 
And so I'll, I'll be racing in a new age group, there you go. Uh, which opens up all kinds of possibilities, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's, it, it definitely does. No, that's, that's cool. That's, that's a very, very intelligent plan. That's a, that's a very intelligent plan. So yeah. speaking of intelligent plans, one of the things I really liked in the piece you wrote was like how you did sort of um, approach menopause the way you would any big race, you know, right. and you described it as like sort of your head heart heat plan i was wondering if you can like talk a little bit about yeah. that um approach for our audience oh, absolutely so um i've come to call this the power triangle and so here's kind of just the sketch and then i'll sort of put it in race perspective um so when I am thinking about either a race or um, a series of races over a season, um, the first thing I do is, okay, what do I, what am I going to race and what does that look like? How does it fit into the calendar? So all those intellectual head pieces, the research, if you will. Um, the next is the heart piece. And really to me, this is the core of it. This is, I call this sacred space. Um, this is digging into my why do I, you know, do I have a compelling why? Because I'll tell you, um, in the middle of a rough race, um, I always laugh and say at mile 85 and a hundred, if you don't have a compelling why the beast is going to take you down. Yep. Um, yep. but the <laughs> other part of <laughs> the <laughs> other part of heart is my family and friends. So, you know, I sit down with my wife and say, hey, how does this fit into everything else? Are you game for this? Because if we're going to not be in agreement on what the game plan is, and, and to be clear, she's tremendously supportive. She's a lifelong ultra runner. Um, and so, um, you know, but, but if you don't have family support and you don't have friends, um, it's going to be really, you're not going to get over the rough parts. Yeah. Um, so you can have done all the intellectual stuff, the head part, but if you haven't done the heart space, uh, it gets really hard. And then heat is just the nuts and bolts. Here's the training plan. Go out and do it um, and make sure you take your, you know, make your notes at the at the end of your run. So, you know, the next day where you are and, and yeah. Um, and I, I like to say that, you know, I like the image of the triangle because if any of it is out of balance and my space that I usually get out of balance is I think too much. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just kind of remind myself, okay, got to get out of your head and get back into the why and the connection and the people, or you got to get out of your head and quit worrying about the details and just go do your run. Um, and um, so that's, that's where the power triangle uh, comes in. And so I use and, that for yeah, planning for races. Mm -hmm. um, but as I started thinking about this whole idea of the menopause 200, um, it's really, if you will, menopause is a big, long ultra. Uh, we're going to be here for 30 years mm -hmm. and there's going to be new research. Um, we are absolutely needing to have connection and conversation with each other to support each other and just get out there and do the workouts um, together often because uh, I think that helps a lot. Um, and um, yeah, so that's how I then took the power triangle and sort of expanded it, if you will, to the idea of the menopause 200 articles. Yeah. I really, yeah. I really appreciated those. And and you you applied sort of those same principles to your menopausal care and approach, correct? Actually, what's been fun is as I was writing the articles, um, I thought, huh, I this is really sort of how I approach many things. So I'm a scientist. I lead with my head. <laughs> um, and and but then, you know, I got to get out of my head and go to my heart. And then I got to get out of my heart and go do things. And um, as I was writing it for the menopause 200, I thought, no, I do this for a lot of things, anything from planning to go on a trip to big stuff. Um, but yeah, it it's scalable. How's that? 
<laughs> How has it been received by the ultra running community in the for the who reads the oh yeah the who read, so yeah. um I have been just so humbled by the emails I've gotten mm. from runners. Um, it's so the first um, article published in July on the online magazine and um i i literally the emails that that women sent me i i was like okay that that made all the agony of writing it so worthwhile and and keeps me committed to continuing to get the information out there because it was so clear that the need is there there's so little available around ultra running around endurance sports. I mean, you and your team, uh, Stacey Sims, are gradually changing that paradigm. Um, I would say ultra running is sort of a niche sport and um, we're kind of a bunch of introverts off running in the hills. <laughs> yep. so we're kind of, a, we're a little late to the table. <laughs> um, and we really need to hear this um, because I do think we can keep running. We just need to understand what we need to change in our running. Yeah, no, that's excellent, excellent points. I, and I was really thrilled. I don't know if you had caught the episode with Magda Boulay yet, but she was on the show and I was- Oh, okay, yeah, I gotta go find that one. Yeah, find yeah. that one, it was early on. And I was really thrilled to have her on because she was so open and transparent. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was just like talking a lot about like some of the issues that she was having, you know, she yeah. runs like Western States and Leadville and a lot of those. And with the thermal regulation, she was like, it's just kind of a nightmare. She's like, I have all the layers and they're on and they're off and they're on and they're off sort of all the time because, yeah. you know, it just gets harder to sort of manage that. And yeah. especially when it's hard to manage it already, you know, when you're already talking okay. about a 40 degree start and going, God, it could be 80 at some point in the day and back to you know it's that's difficult already throw in some hot flashes and sweats and you know it's a whole other it's a whole new game oh it is and i think the hydration piece because you just mm. i mean when you're sweating i mean i just drench myself <laughs> i mean my shoes my socks you know people look and say did you go through a puddle <laughs> no i didn't uh, that's just literally how much my feet sweat and it just changes your calculus about Mm -hmm. how much hydration you've got to have with you and when you're talking some of these mountain races where you might be two and a half or three hours between aid um that begins to be you know some significant um logistics that you have to think about yeah for sure yeah and she, it's yeah. funny you thought, like she talks about she does box jumps with a weighted vest she does hill repeat she does a lot of that stuff you know to keep her bones strong and to keep the yes. fast twitch muscles and all of that have you changed anything else about your fueling or any of your prep, you know, accordingly? Um, so I've been more consistent with my plyometrics. So I, I'd already been, uh, I'd already incorporated jumping rope because of some other studies around uh, running and tendon mm -hmm. contractility. Um, but I kind of mix it up more. Um, I'd already been doing strength training. Uh, so I just, you know, remind myself that that's, that's just the gotta be, um, the one that I will acknowledge that is just the struggle is the, the sit or the hit training, um, you know, getting those high intensity, um, intervals. And, um, I've, I've, I've been using a uh, spin class, uh, and doing hit, uh, intervals there because sometimes that's just easier to get. That's a good, oh, it's a good done. way. Yeah, I know um, that's a great way to do it. And then the other thing that um, that I've changed that's just really fun is meeting up with other women and we'll do, so there's a, a nice email that comes out once a week, the athletic aging workout. Um, oh, from Dr. And, Carla DiGirolamo, yes, who I love. And so, yes. so, you know, we'll meet up at the track and they're so fun because they're come you know it's it's often you know if you haven't if you don't have a crossfit background it feels very like oh we're doing here and here and here <laughs> but it's great because you know we get back into our little kid mode 
and right. um, you know shuttle runs, um, which I had I literally hadn't done since um, I think high I school. Uh, yeah, I, well, I didn't even do I didn't even do shuttle runs in high school. I played field hockey, so I did them in high school. But yeah, um, but yeah, so that's another piece, and then being just more intentional in reaching out to my peers and saying, Hey, how are you? Um, what I noticed is as I turned 50, a lot of the women I had been running with just disappeared off the scene. And I didn't kind of think about it at the time. I mean, I certainly looked around and went, wow, there was a big drop off between the 40, 49 age group and the 50, 59 age group in terms of how many women were running. Um, but I'm being much more conscientious about reaching out and saying, hey, let's go on a run and opening the conversation about, you know, even starting with, hey, this is what I'm trying. How are you feeling? Um, holding space for that, um, because I think that's really, really important, those connections. That's, that's wonderful. And it is really, really important. I mean, those connections are you know, we hear over and over again how women feel invisible or want to be invisible and not not like themselves and sort of shrink out, you know, into the shadows. So it's the more that we can sort of like shine a light and be like, hey, <laughs> you, <in> there, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. come on out. <laughs> yeah, Let's talk yeah. about this. It's we're all we're all in it together. Um, yeah. I think is really useful like beyond useful I think it's really important it's, oh it's yeah and I'm also um this isn't actually a training piece but it's a it's a thought piece so it sort of gets back to the heart piece um you know my wife and I we figure we try to be examples for like the nieces and the grandkids in terms of both getting out and working out but also using our running and hiking to go adventuring and exploring outdoors. Um, but if we just show them the good stuff, you know, if you never show them the struggles yep. then they get a false sense of what's out there and they get a false sense of the world. And so we, we try to be honest about, you know, I went on a, a um, bike ride, a mountain biking ride that was over my skill set. <laughs> and <laughs> let's just say, uh, it was supposed to be 22 miles, seven miles in. I said, bye guys, I'm going back. You go on because this is really not a good place for me to be. And I thought, you know, it's really important that I tell my grandson, hey, look, I tried this, didn't work. I went and did something really, really fun and I learned from it, but it's okay to say "I that's, you know, that that's not where I can be right now. Right. Um, totally. And so that's the other, if you will, way I'm leveraging this experience to um, help them just learn about life. Cause this yeah. is life, you know, totally. this is life. <laughs> yeah. No, a hundred percent. I, I, I love all of that. You know, I, I, and I have to, I have to ask, cause this is a little, this is a little tangential, but because you are a veterinarian and you mentioned to me offline, you've been kind of embarrassed about like how long it took you to understand your physical changes that were coming from changing hormone levels, you know, given your medical background. But, you know, I, I understood that sentiment logically, but then I think like, we don't really talk about menopause in, in animals much. Like whenever I've heard it, it's like, narwhals whales and maybe giraffes like literally like that's all i've heard and i'm curious if you this has made you think about the animal experience differently um it's more around um so so my embarrassment really comes from my physiology background and how mm. much therogenology i had in veterinary school you know you know about the hormone cycles, you know what the various hormones do, um, you know what backwards and sideways, and you know it for the different uteruses and, you know, mm. pregnancies and all of that kind of stuff. Um, you spend an awful lot of time on it and that I just oh, didn't connect the dots that right. things were changing. Right. I was like, oh, yeah. Um, I think there's now like five 
uh, mammals that they mm -hmm. identified menopause in. Um, I've worked with non-human primates and there's a, you know, kind of an ongoing discussion about, do they have menopause? Hmm. Um, we certainly know they reach what we call reproductive senescence. So they're no longer, you know, fertile. So something's happening. Um, the hormone changes don't seem to be on par with what's happening, but I also, as a veterinarian will say, we have so much to learn. Um, and, and if you think about how do we mostly understand menopause and the menopause transition through conversation, um, right. and, 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 and that becomes, you know, you can be a very astute observer of animal behavior and, and, and still miss a lot of that. Yeah. So, oh no, yeah. that makes, yes, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. And I don't speak narwhal really well, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> That's and, and, you know um this has been super duper delightful is there anything that you thought of conveying to the audience that we haven't covered oh um you know i think i'm just double checking my list um i i do want to i just want to give a shout out to uh amy clark and the ultra running uh, uh magazine staff uh this was a you know, they went out on a limb when I pitched this whole menopause 200 idea to them. And, um, you know, cause you know, it's mostly men in the sport <laughs> right, and fair. it's a lot of young men. Um, I sort of, when I, when I first talked to Amy, I was like, we could call it mature adult content. Um, <laughs> <laughs> menopause 200 is, is, is catchier. Um, but uh, that kind of courage and courage in the conversations, um, I think are just so important. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge Amy for that. Yeah. Um, Bravo. Yeah. Thank you, Amy. I, I agree. You know, having worked in uh, publishing for my bulk of my career, you know, I know that, you know, some things don't, fl don't just don't fly. And I'm just glad that, um, things are changing and that, yeah. that, that there was a space for you to put this out there. Cause it's super important. And as you have discovered, there was a need. Yes. Yes. Indeed. Well, that's our show. Join me next week when I sit down with Kim Vapni of vaginacoach.com. Kim is a leading authority in health and fitness coaching for women with pelvic floor dysfunction. She has helped Thousands of women, including herself, learn how to do pelvic floor exercises. And I learned a lot right out of the gate, including that I have been doing some incorrectly so they can ditch the incontinence pads and eliminate the prolapse symptoms to get back to living life to the fullest. We had a tremendous conversation. So come on back for that one. And until then, as always, stay feisty. <laughs>been listening to hit play not pause a feisty menopause podcast for active performance minded women i'm your host celine yeager the show is edited and produced by the strong talented and amazing women at live feisty media follow us on social media at feisty menopause and please help us spread the word screenshot and share this episode on your social media channels with the tag at feisty menopause share the show with your friends and please subscribe, like, review, and rate this show wherever you get your podcasts. Word of mouth and good reviews make it easier for other listeners to find. Thanks for listening, and as always, stay feisty. Stay feisty.